Exalt, let them exalt the hosts of heaven. Gregorian chant, you might call it poetry in music. It's very simple in some ways and yet complex at times. Exalt, let angel ministers of God exalt. The way in which we worship God is with our voices, singing. When we sing, we pray twice. Let the trumpet of salvation sound aloud our mighty King's triumph. Gregorian chant is a particular chant that developed in the later 7th century on through the 9th century in the Diocese of Rome, and it is the proper chant of the mature Roman rite. Be glad, let earth be glad as glory floods her, ablaze with light from her eternal King. Gregorian chant is the music of the Catholic Church. And look at priests. When they sing certain parts of the Mass, that's chant. And they respond with Amen. Whether you're talking English, Latin, Spanish, there's a natural response that occurs among the congregation because it's been so instilled into the Catholic faith. It is natural. People get it. Let all corners of the earth be glad, knowing an end to gloom and darkness. <laughs> There are parts of Mass that are sung by the priest, and most priests do them. They may not realize, oh, I'm chanting, <laughs> um, but they, they really are. The text is key. The text is all important. And the music is there to elevate the text. The variety of melodic types in the chant are widespread. So simple things like, you know, the Lord be with you and also with you. That's actually Gregorian chant because it is the native chant of the Roman liturgy. So this dialogue, this kind of ebb and flow of prayer directed in this way, that actually is the essence of what this music does. It lifts up our hearts. And at that incredibly important moment in the liturgy, right before the Eucharistic sacrifice takes place, this idea of lifting up your hearts in song is a kind of a metaphor for the kind of prayer. There's so much lifting up in the liturgy from incense, which goes up and the priest elevates the sacred species at the Mass. The music is also something that we have a sense that the music goes up. This is the image of music. This interplay is absolutely essential to our sung prayer tradition. What separates Gregorian chant from traditional sacred music is that chant is not scored to rhyme or meter. It's prayer and song, and scored to elevate the text of the liturgy of the Catholic Church. The liturgy is sung because, as Augustine noted, when we pray in song, it's almost as if we're praying twice. And I think what he meant by that was to speak something requires a certain amount of energy and kind of commitment to it. But to sing something, to say, Our Father who art in heaven, is one thing. To sing it, Our Father who art in heaven, that uses so much more of your body. I mean, literally, you burn more calories doing it. It incorporates much more of you. 
it's the Catholic way of doing something, and I mean by that, that we're not afraid to use our bodies. We kneel and stand and sit and bow, and we use our bodies in liturgy. And one of the ways that we use our bodies is in song, and it's something that humans can do, and it's a way of intensifying. And in some ways, it helps carry the emotion of the chant uh, more effectively. So that's why we sing at all. So chant is one form of that embodying prayer. The text and tunes of the liturgy are more profound than art. They carry the beliefs of the church. They carry biblical praise of the church. In that liturgy that God has given us, we have an opportunity to encounter Him in a profound and beautiful way. And every day that we encounter Him in the Mass is an opportunity for us to bring our best and to bring beauty to that liturgy and our talents to that liturgy. Gregorian chant, sung liturgy and prayers essential to the Mass, is distinct from other sacred music and hymns, which are often layered with rich harmonies. There are beautiful points in the Mass where you can add meditative pieces that add to the reflection of a moment, for instance, at the offertory or after communion. And those pieces are sacred insofar as they have holy texts and are sung at Mass, but the texts themselves are not part of the makeup of the Mass in the same way. So it's also a kind of sacred music because they are holy texts, but they are not integral to the liturgy in the same way that the chants are. Gregorian chant is a very ancient way of sung prayer. Gregorian chant is one of the earliest forms of expression that we have written. There's a lot of mystery about the origin of the name Gregorian being attached to this body of music. Typically, most people associate that with Pope Gregory I, Gregory the Great, as the originator of this movement of creating chants for the Roman liturgy. And in fact, it's very unlikely that he had any direct involvement in the creation of this music. However, Pope Gregory, when he came to power as the Pope at the end of the 6th century and the beginning of the 7th century, Rome was really in terrible condition as a city. It was under siege. There were a lot of military campaigns uh, that were threatening Rome. The plague was running rampant at the time, also in the city when he became Pope. And so Pope Gregory was a building pope, and as he sort of reordered the city after this period of distress, a lot of that had to do with reordering the liturgy and reestablishing liturgical practice in an orderly way. And so his role in the liturgy was very, very strong at the beginning of the seventh century. The music itself really began to develop a couple of generations after Pope Gregory, and in fact, many historians think that it's Pope Gregory II who reigned about a hundred years later was the Pope Gregory who actually had more of a hand in formulating this body of chants that we call Gregorian chant. Other types of music have a consistent beat and a regular pattern that's expected. Gregorian chant is very mysterious and it takes you in different directions even when you least expect it. Sort of the most exquisite examples of melody 
There's only tune. There's no harmony. There's no accompaniment. And so its actual shape are these beautiful curving melodies that we've come to know as that Gregorian style, that prayerful style of singing. And the fact that it is somewhat elaborate and somewhat involved melodically, that's where the beauty lies. That's why it is so moving. Its character is such that it really is pure melody, unlike any other body of melody in the entire world. So it has the sense of soaring up to the sky, soaring up to heaven, just perfect for the theology of sacred music. It's sending the human heart right up to God. Gregorian chant has a place in most parishes, even if it's just the priest singing a portion of the liturgy or prayers. However, in the years following the Second Vatican Council, the once dominant chant and sacred music was replaced with folk, praise and worship, and gospel genres at Catholic masses throughout the U.S. Though Gregorian chant has made a revival in the past 20 years, it's not the central music force in most Catholic church choirs. The key word here is most, because there are some church communities, like St. John the Beloved in McLean, Virginia, that is woven Gregorian chant through the fabric of parish life. At this specific parish, it is different because what you see is a very modern architecture, yet what you hear is sacred music. Parish leaders at St. John the Beloved decided more than a decade ago to switch the church's principal music from the praise and worship genre to Gregorian chant in every choir at every mass. They even began teaching it in the parish school and in their religious educational programs. They wanted a sound that was uniquely Catholic with ties to the early church. When I chant, it helps me feel like I'm participating in the worship of the angels in heaven, rather than when I sing a song. It's just a beautiful way to make everything more sacred. Every Mass at the busy parish now has elements of Gregorian chant, sung in both Latin and English, including the children's choir. The students at the parish school, St. John's Academy, are taught Gregorian chant at every level. Even the homeschooled students who attend religious education classes at St. John's Academy are taught Gregorian chant. For those who sing well, they are encouraged to join one of the parish's many choirs and scholas. I think that the music brings out the text and helps me to understand it better. I do give great priority to the chants. So every lesson, every class, every rehearsal, we do start with warm-ups that are specifically designed to help free the voice for chant, and then also with chant theories and also the solfeging, the ability to sight-read the chant. I do think children understand chant. I think children get it. They have already a musical soul. Kids already chant or have sing-songy things that they do back and forth. The proof that children get chant and the proof that adults are aware of children getting chant is that when the children's scola is chanting, the adults just want to listen because it's so beautiful. They understand the importance of it too because it is the word of God that they are chanting. They understand that this is a sacred text. They understand that this is an important text and that it is part of the liturgy. Parish leaders admit that some regular churchgoers were initially upset when they changed the music focus, and some did ultimately change parishes because of it. 
However, other Catholics craving Gregorian chant began to fill up the pews at St. John the Beloved, citing the music as the main attraction. We have the support of the parish and the support of those singers and the musicians who truly love sacred liturgy and love the fullness of the Catholic faith. Gregorian chant. Yes, it's certainly been revived, especially I would say in the last 10 to 15 years there's been a great revival of it where people recognize it and they have some familiarity with it and also an attraction to it at some level or a curiosity. This is a really interesting phenomenon since the early 1990s. We've seen peaked interest in Gregorian chant and really sacred music in general. It all sort of began with a very, very successful album in the early 1990s that was simply called Chant. And this Chant album was an incredible commercial success for the record company that put it out. And people became interested in it. And then you would start to hear Gregorian chant as samples in popular music. You'd start to hear it in film soundtracks, things like that, where Gregorian chant became part of sort of a popular consciousness of spiritual. And so Gregorian chant became popular with all kinds of people, with all kinds of belief systems. But I think at that point, members of the church started to recognize that this has intrinsic value and that this is our proper music for our liturgy. And that movement of recovery of this material, I think, started at that point when it was recognized more broadly as a tremendous treasure, which, of course, the church and certainly the Second Vatican Council, this was reiterated, has always postulated. For any of us who grew up in the 80s and 90s and who have come back to the faith, we've realized that there were many things that we were missing from our own education as Catholics growing up that included the sacred music that we missed out on, the Gregorian chant that we missed out on. It always grows and then recedes to arc the fruit. There was a certain amount of forgetfulness about this great tradition, particularly in the years that followed the liturgical reforms of the Second Vatican Council. There was a period of focusing on what was new in the liturgy, and that in turn led to a kind of forgetting of what was old and ancient and perennial in the liturgy. That was also partly fed by the fact that the language of the Gregorian chant had always been Latin, and it takes time to adapt this incredibly complex body of music into a, a usable form, for example, in the vernacular liturgy. So since that time, we've seen a growth of interest in singing chant in English, for instance, which I think has been part of this recovery process. And what's beautiful about that, I think, is encountering this music in English in many ways uh, begins to attune your ear to the older tradition of singing this music in Latin, and so that there is a reconnection, a re-establishing continuity with our ancient traditions there. So I think we've seen a real revival in the last 20 years or so in this respect. I think the use of Gregorian chant it is a relatively uncommon feature in the modern American liturgical experience to see Gregorian chant being used in the liturgy. However, there are pockets of excitement about this music. I think many of the cathedrals throughout the country cultivate this kind of music. 
and there needs to be some measure of leadership and I think there is a growing number of younger church musicians for whom this is becoming more and more a part of their spiritual and musical formation and I think there is a genuine increase. As a university professor, I have seen a heightened awareness among young people coming in about this repertoire. And so I can only conclude that there is a, a broadening interest in this music in the parishes. When Gregorian chant was introduced at Mass in the first millennium, it was most likely sung by men only. Though women routinely sang chant during prayers in their abbeys and for the office at the Vatican, the Holy See didn't officially sanction them to sing it during Mass until the 20th century. The tradition of only male voices is linked to a theological reason. There is the understanding that singing sacred music is a somewhat clerical act. So you're participating in a kind of the priestly office. For that reason, there would only be men who would be singing, or men or boys. Women, however, did have an impact on Gregorian chant from the early days of the practice. There were even women composing Gregorian chant, even if they were not officially permitted to sing it in Mass. The permission to do that was not really granted until the 1950s, which is surprising to many people, that you could have a mixed choir in the church. That was really a later development. Nevertheless, it certainly did happen before that, particularly in places like Austria, where the large-scale choral Mass with elaborate long soprano solos would obviously have called for women to sing them in many cases. Much of this was sort of regulated on a regional basis, and so I would say the history is sort of patchy in that respect. In some places that was the case, especially the further north you would go. In places like Spain, for example, even many of those choirs in the Renaissance didn't even have boys. They only had adult males singing. So there were many, many women who were involved in teaching the chant, but they were not necessarily authorized to actually sing it in the choir lofts of our churches. And so at this point in the 1950s, when there was widespread interest, there was growing competence in this material, I think that there was a movement that the Holy See responded to to say, yes, you could have women singing in the parish churches in mixed choirs. And I think the issue was much more of mixed choirs with men and women singing together, more so than just women singing or just men singing. And so that's an important distinction, I think, in this development. In the 20th century, women and girls have really an opportunity to join their voices in praising God, and it's a beautiful opportunity. And I do see it as an expression of that beautiful theology that in all of creation is singing the praises of God. to Gregorian chant started when I became Catholic, which was about five and a half years ago. I remember I grew up singing in the Southern Baptist Church and was very involved in music and have been singing for most of my life. And that was something that has always been a major attraction to me. Music has always spoken to my heart in a very beautiful way. And I remember the first Mass that I went to on a Saturday night at a church outside of Memphis, and the priest sung the entire Mass. And obviously I'd never been to a mass before. I'd never encountered any kind of chant in my life at that point. And it was something that was just mesmerizing. It, it absolutely took me to another place altogether. It was, there was something about it that was immediately brought to my mind. I'm experiencing something that is holy right now. There's something very solemn and very reverent going on in, in a way that I'd never experienced in a Protestant church. 
And it was something that really touched me as a musician and as a singer. It was something that, that just captivated me. As soon as Mass was over, I immediately went and talked to that priest and I was like, how do I become Catholic? That was such a big part of that catalyst of just like, I want this. You know, I'd spoken with my sister. She had become Catholic a, a year and a half before that and she was the one who really led me into the church. And when I went to Mass and I experienced that music, that chant, that was what really clued me into there's something here, there's something really beautiful and something unique. And so that was my first experience with chant. As I came into the Catholic Church and began working in ministry and working in music in the Catholic Church, that was something that became one of my favorite ways of singing. I sing a lot of different types of music. You know, I've been led to praise and worship bands and I was a music director for the, the Catholic Church of the Ascension in Memphis, Tennessee, and there did all sorts of different types of music. So we did Gregorian chant, we did contemporary worship type music, we did traditional hymns, we did all sorts of things. But chant was always something that moved me and uh, something that meant a lot to me. When Father Christopher Pollard entered the seminary at Washington's Theological College in 1993, the music he encountered at the school was what he had heard in most parishes, but no Gregorian chant. So the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception is also across the street from TC. And in those days at noon, there was a, a mass in Latin down in the Crypt Church, which is a gorgeous church. Uh, the acoustics are perfect. And there was a Cistercian priest who was chanting the entire Mass, and it was ethereal. It was amazing. And so he, at our request, taught three, four of us a little class in chant uh, through the course of that year. That training in Gregorian chant would have a profound impact on the young seminarian, and after ordination, it would inform how he led parish life Chant had fallen out of favor in most American parishes post-Vatican II and was no longer required coursework in the early 1990s. Pre-Vatican II Mass was in Latin, not in the native vernacular as it is today. Priests could be called on to sing the Latin Mass. So, what did that mean about seminarians? They were in seminaries before the 60s? They all had to sing. So in other words, you couldn't become a seminarian unless you could sing, or at least had the desire to sing and learn to sing, because the Mass was sung. Now that's not a requirement. Though Gregorian chant may not be a mandatory part of the curriculum in most U.S. seminaries, the music has experienced renewed interest among Catholics in the past 20 years, and future priests are often exposed to it in seminary life. I would say it's a requirement for every seminarian to know the fundamentals of how to sing chant because it's part of our liturgy. When somebody says, Our Father, we immediately all know that that's the chant that we're about to sing. So we have <clears throat> chants throughout, the responses. That if a priest sings, we have to sing a response. So there's aspects of that that are mandatory. I think for every Catholic, that if you're going to participate in a liturgy and know what you're doing, you need to at least know those basics. There are also aspects of seminary where there is more chant than an average layperson might experience in a required sense in liturgy. So for example, when we do night prayer, we sing the Salve Regina. That's a classic Gregorian chant piece. Every seminarian in the country or in the world knows that piece. Every priest, every religious, we all know that. Whereas as a layperson, I had never encountered that before. So there are aspects that are definitely a requirement. But as far as the amount of Gregorian chant that you would like to learn as far as your ability to sing it, as far as your desire to know how to read Gregorian chant notation, all those different intricacies, and, and to take that to a next level, that would be on the elective level for sure. To the Lord, hear our prayer. My family would probably tell you my singing ability is somewhere around the level of making what my dad calls a joyful noise, as opposed to, uh, you know, raw talent, but I'm preparing to be ordained a priest, God willing, and part of that preparation is learning how to say Mass. And so the Missal, which has the parts of the Mass in it, also has sung parts for all the different parts of the Mass, and it's sung in chant. So I figured might as well have another tool in my toolkit 
and be ready to sing the Mass. So once a week, been meeting with our music director here at the seminary, just shaking the rust off the vocal cords and trying to learn some of these parts. Even the sparrow finds a home. I think that there are seminaries that have chosen in recent years to sort of reestablish this connection to the liturgical musical history and the liturgical patrimony that Gregorian chant is. I don't think that it is completely integrated into our idea of seminary formation at this point. Our priests are really inundated with tremendous responsibilities nowadays that are relatively new to the priesthood. The resources that they will face when they come into the life of the parish and the diocese are going to be fewer. There are fewer of them in many places. And so there's a lot of pressure that kind of puts musical formation a little bit off to the side. But I think that there is such an intense interest in our young seminarians in this material that they are taking their own steps in acquiring this information. That is not to say that there aren't some fabulous seminary music directors who are really taking great steps to expose the seminarians to this music. And many of them within the seminary, the ones who choose to be in the choir, get a rather extensive training in Gregorian chant nowadays. As a priest in the future, I feel that one of my priorities will definitely be beautiful music. And so I feel that Gregorian chant will absolutely take a pride of place in those liturgies. recognize that Gregorian chant has periods of intense popularity and interest and then periods where it does recede. This ebb and flow of interest in Gregorian chant continued in the 20th century, with the resurgence bolstered by Pope Pius X and Pope Pius XII in the early 1900s, only to see the practice all but disappear following the Second Vatican Council even though documents from the Council firmly stated the music's significance in the Mass. It's very clear in the documents of Vatican II that chant takes pride of place above any music that we have, liturgically speaking. So I feel that chant should definitely have a predominance. Gregorian chant has experienced a resurgence since the 1990s, but it's not a dominant force in Catholic parishes in the early decades of the 21st century. However, some Catholic church music enthusiasts believe the parish leaders who infuse more Gregorian chant will be performing an act of evangelization and enhance the spiritual life of churchgoers. Chant is beautiful and beauty is important in the liturgy because beauty is a way that we encounter God. And so sort of meditating on each word individually, on each scripture of the text because it's so simplistic but so complex in its simplicity, I think that's the beauty of chant. So much is set to a psalm or a piece of the gospel. So you're hearing the word of God and you're hearing it in a way that is meant to be evocative of the beauty of that word. When I hear Gregorian chant, I feel that I'm not part of this world. I am in a contemplative state and I hear the voice of God in its fullness, rich in communication, and it's simple. It's because it's different. It's because it, it lifts our minds to heaven. It's ethereal, it's something other. I feel like that's the reason why the church gives pride of place to Gregorian chant. You feel this solemnness and this beauty that can only kind of come about because of chant. You know, it's again, elevated speech. I do think it's a treasure of the church. I think it's part of our heritage. And I think it's unjust, at least for people not to know that it's an integral part of, of worship. So if a parish is not familiar with it, I think it wouldn't be out of the question to say, hey, we have 
this whole storehouse of stuff that perhaps you've never heard before. When I'm cantering the Mass, when they're singing the chant, and I get to be up front listening, <laughs> and that's just as wonderful hearing the fruit of the labor that I was there to see that this choir worked so hard on to really bring these texts to life in these chants in a way that opens up the hearts of the faithful to the text and being able to see that come alive before my eyes is really, really cool. I think even a skeptic could come in and feel something, be changed at least for an instant because I think the church's liturgy is powerful. I think it's divinely inspired. I think the music is divinely inspired.